everyone, and welcome to Maho Profile. Today we'll be covering the first character in our timeline who really pushes the... limit of what many fans consider a magical girl. For hers is a tale of mechanism over magic, more sci-fi than fantasy. Her name is Satomi Limit Nishiyama, and she is the star of the 1973 series Mirakuru Shoujo Rimito-chan, or Miracle Girl Limit-chan. In our broad categorization of magical girls, Limit is a homegrown heroine type, someone who starts out as a normal human girl, but gains extraordinary powers through outside means. However, Limit isn't the typical homegrown heroine empowered by a magic item or some benevolent creature. No, the setup here is that Limit suffers a near-fatal injury in a plane crash, and wouldn't you know it, her mad scientist father turns her into a super-powered cyborg to save her life. Ugh, parents. Always assuming they know what's best for you, am I right? So to you other kids all across the land, there's no need to argue, parents just don't understand. Yeah, this is less of a magical girl origin story and more akin to something like The Six Million Dollar Man, or The Bionic Woman, or even Robocop. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. Better. Stronger. Faster. Notably, The Six Million Dollar Man began airing in 1973, the same year as Limit Chan. And the best-selling novel that both It and The Bionic Woman were based on, Martin Caden's Cyborg, came out the year before in 1972. The 1970s in general saw a lot of science fiction films and TV shows interested in themes of humanity and robotics, including but not limited to the original Westworld, Silent Running, Battlestar Galactica, The Stepford Wives, The Black Hole, to some extent the original Star Wars, and Japanese hero series like Kamen Rider and Android Kikaider. Basically what I'm saying is, this was a pretty good time for cyborgs all around. Other predecessors to Limit Chan include Astro Boy, who has a similar backstory with a grieving parent rebuilding their child as a robot, and Eight Man, a character regarded as Japan's first cyborg superhero. Apart from him being just generally influential in Japanese sci-fi, Eight Man's ability to transform into other people and his need to hide his cyborg identity are both key elements that ended up carrying over to Limit Chan. So, yes, Limit has some extraordinary abilities, but mostly because of all the science behind her cybernetically enhanced body. It's wild, unrealistic science, for sure, but within the fiction, it's clearly just that science, not magic. So why include a seemingly non-magical girl like Limit in our history of magical girls, huh? What gives? Well, remember that in the introduction of this series, I laid down a definition for magical girl as a genre. It states that the main character must have magic powers, or at least superhuman abilities that appear magical. I added that caveat specifically because there are a few works like Limit Chun out there which are commonly considered magical girl, including by their own creators, but which do not, technically speaking, involve any magic. The most commonly cited example of this aside from Limit Chun is Cutie Honey, a transforming android girl we'll be talking more about shortly. However, we can also extend this principle to less obvious examples, like say, Magical Girl Lyrical Nanoha. Nanoha is undeniably a Magical Girl series. It has a recognizable Magical Girl aesthetic, it has the tropes, and... Come on, it has Magical Girl... It has Magical Girl right there in the name! What are you, what are you arguing about? All the magic in that series, though? I mean, mild spoilers for season one of Nanoha, but that's all revealed to be just a very advanced form of science and technology. And what's that old Arthur C. Clarke saying we always hear? Any sufficiently advanced technology and such? Yeah, my point being, technomagic is valid. What counts as magic in a magical girl story is more dependent on the way the story treats it, how characters react to it, and the aesthetics and trappings associated with it. It has less to do with any inherently magical principles at work. If that's confusing to you, 
think of it like how Batman and Iron Man are still considered superheroes despite them not having traditional superpowers. The abilities they do have, technology, wealth, a laser focus on the symptoms of crime rather than the systemic inequalities which create it, are used in such a way that they can still participate in superheroics and create the same sorts of stories that traditionally powered characters do. Technology-based magical girls, or techno-mages as I like to call them, use their tech in such a way that onlookers usually can't tell the difference between what they do and straight-up magic. In addition, their stories follow the other core principles laid out in my definition of magical girl, namely that their abilities are significant to the narrative and contrast with the mundane world in some way. So, stories with heavy sci-fi settings where the inhabitants are used to a high level of tech? Less likely to be candidates for the genre, although there are some exceptions. Anyway, Miracle Girl Limit Chan in particular is also considered part of the Magical Girl genre for one other big reason. Because it aired in NET's traditional Majoko or Little Witch Girl time slot of Mondays at 7pm. Despite having a non-witchy protagonist, this show was clearly meant to be the long-awaited successor to the Majoko meta series after Chappie the Witch. In fact, it was designed to be more of a Majoko series than it was originally going to be. You see, Toei actually had two shows about magical transforming android girls in the works at the same time, both being pitched as potential candidates for the Majoko time slot. Limit Chan was being worked on in conjunction with Hiromi Productions, a planning company consisting mainly of former employees from Tezuka Productions. Their idea was in competition with another concept being worked on with Go Nagai and his company Dynamic Productions. And that concept, of course, was Cutie Honey. If you know anything about Cutie Honey, it sounds wild that that show would be let anywhere near an audience of young girls. However, as we'll cover next episode, that show was originally planned to be more of a romance-oriented shoujo series, similar to the later Cutie Honey Flash series in the 1990s. So, planning to air it in the Majoko time slot made a lot more sense at the time. However, it was Miracle Girl Limit Chan that ultimately won the right to that coveted 7pm slot. This was possibly due in part to the strong story concept offered up by manga artist Shinji Nagashima. Now, Nagashima was maybe an odd choice for the project considering he was known for writing stories aimed at older men. I mean, it's not that surprising, considering every Magical Girl series we've covered up to now has been conceived of and written by older men, but still. No, Nagashima was also an odd choice, considering his stories were known for their dark and gritty tones. And sure enough, Nagashima's original series pitch outlined a darker, more angst-ridden show in line with popular shoujo manga and past Majoko series like Maho no Mako-chan. The protagonist, Satomi, would have sustained mortal injuries in a plane crash, and upon being revived as a cyborg, found out that she only had one year left to live. The nickname Limit refers to this one-year time limit. So if you were wondering why on earth someone would be called Limit of all things, well, that's why. Toei really liked Nagashima's concept of a girl being saved from death by becoming a cyborg, I would guess this is the reason they picked it for the Majoko slot over Cutie Honey. However, NET felt the one-year time limit and darker tone would be too harsh for their audience. After some further workshopping, the series ended up more in line with their usual light-hearted Majoko formula, although the protagonist retained Limit as her nickname for no adequately explored reason. In the final product, we have 11-year-old Limit living as a cyborg but keeping it secret for fear of being shunned by society. She goes to school, has friends, and tries to help people out with her abilities when she can. To give those abilities more of a magical flavor, Limit calls them her miracle powers. Her main abilities are Miracle Run, which is super speed, Miracle Jump, guess what that one is, and just plain Miracle Power, which is super strength. These powers activate when she turns the pendant dial on her chest and speaks the name of the power she wants to use. Most interestingly, as I mentioned earlier, Limit also has a shape-shifting ability called Change Face. Change Face! This allows her to transform Akko's style into anyone she wants, 
And she can change back with the phrase, uh, change back. Change back! Well, this seems like it would be one of the most useful abilities in Limit's roster, and it certainly is her most magical girl-like ability. Strangely though, she doesn't use it all that often. The problems Limit runs into just don't tend to call for it. Plus she's a pretty straight-laced character, so she doesn't have much motivation to use the ability for personal gain like, say, Akko did in Himitsu no Akko-chan. As a result, this just ends up feeling like kind of an afterthought power for her. Huh. Limit can also do a few tricks with the help of some quote-unquote magic accessories from her father. These include a winged shoulder bag that allows her to fly, a ring that emits a hypnotic scent, boots that let her dance and skate like an expert, a booby-trapped coin purse, lip balm that can write secret messages, a compact with a hidden light that lets her see through walls, and her most frequently used accessory, a flying beret that doubles as a radio. Well, sort of a radio, anyway. It's more like an electronic carrier pigeon. To use it, Limit records a voice message and lets the beret fly away to her father's lab, her father then listens, records a response, and sends it flying back to her. Rinse and repeat. Slightly more efficient than snail mail! Slightly less efficient than, oh say, a regular-ass telephone. The last part of Limit's arsenal is a robot dog named Goo. The original pilot version of Episode 1 implies that he's a recreation of a dog that died in the plane crash with Limit. However, in the TV series proper, Goo's origins are never made clear. Regardless, Goo runs on solar power, collecting light from the sun through the antennae on his head. He has a superior sense of smell, and he has flexible legs that can stretch out or change into propeller blades, allowing him to fly around like a helicopter. Dogcopter 3 in 3D. Now, if I've been talking for longer than usual up front about the context, production, and world building for this series, as opposed to the characters and plot, that's because, well, the characters and plot are a bit of a mixed bag, to be honest. There are a lot of good creative choices made, but also a lot of mediocre ones and a few real stinkers. It's a shame because I feel like this series should be much more interesting than it is. This is not an uninteresting premise. Clearly other works have taken the secret cyborg superhero trope and seen massive success with it. And there are many moments in limit -chan where you can see the show's true potential shining through. Usually these are quieter moments with Limit as she contemplates her existence and laments what she no longer has. That classic, how human am I, am I even human at all, angst works super well, especially in stories of this vintage where it was a fresh concept. However, in execution, it's clear that the cyborg angst fest Nagashima pitched didn't mesh well with the Majoko silliness Toei wanted. This is very similar to the issue Mahono Mako-chan had, where the story struggled between its kids' comedy roots and melodramatic shoujo aspirations. This issue hits Limit even harder, though, because Limit's personality seems especially unsuited to Toei's usual formula. Sally, Akko, and Chappie all excelled with a lighthearted format, because they were younger, more mischievous kids whose curiosity and exuberance got them into lots of interesting situations. Even Mako had a certain cheekiness and carefree attitude that let her pull off some of the sillier episodes of her series. By contrast, Limit has probably the lowest key personality we've seen in a Majoko protagonist. Like I said earlier, she's not much of a rule breaker, she's gentle and pleasant, she grapples with a lot of inner pain, and her favorite activities include playing the piano and staring poignantly at the sunset. And when her stronger emotions do rise to the surface, they are often frustration, anger, and fear. Not so much cheekiness or excitement, although there is some of that sometimes. None of these are bad traits. Far from it. Limit is a solid character on paper. She just needs a different kind of story to highlight the things that are interesting about her. She's a bad fit for a high-energy series of weekly shenanigans. And the creators seem to have realized this early on, too. 
because sometimes it feels like Limit is our protagonist in name only. Why's that? Well, I want you all to meet someone. His name is Yuta Ishibashi, better known to most as Boss. He's the head bully slash hooligan of this series in the same vein as Taisho from Akko-chan or Bancho from Mako-chan. And if I didn't know any better, sometimes I could swear that I'm not watching a show called Miracle Girl Limit-chan, but rather some other show I've never heard of called The Boss Time Boss Show starring Boss and Friends. Boss takes focus from the very first scene of the series. Episode 1 begins with Limit and Gu noticing an argument between Boss and a younger boy named Tomal. Limit and Gu watch the argument, meaning we watch the argument, until Boss turns his hat sideways, which is how you know he means business. The boys ride away on their bikes, and Limit follows by activating Miracle Run, with Gu flying behind her. The boys continue their confrontation upon reaching a fenced-off construction area, with Boss framing it as a duel of sorts. What they don't realize is that there's liquid cement and a mixer underneath them. Of course, Tomo falls in, and Boss scrambles to save him. He throws Tomo a nearby rope, and Limit grabs the other end from outside the fence, unseen by the boys. She activates Miracle Power to help Boss pull, and Tomo is saved! Hooray! Afterward, we have a scene where Boss and Tomo hang out with Tomo's older sister, Nobuko, or Buko for short. Buko is this series' Yotchan or Moko type, the tomboyish best friend to the main character. Not much of note happens here, however, notice the consistent characters from the last scene to here are Boss and Tomo, not Limit. We don't see Limit again until the next day at school, when Boss regales the class with tales of his heroism. Limit eventually scolds him for downplaying the way he bullied and endangered Tomo in the first place. Boss threatens Limit, but due to the hidden soft spot all characters like him have, he can't actually bring himself to hit her. Cut to another scene with Boss, this time with him and his cronies walking together after school. One thing leads to another in their conversation, and Boss gets stuck in a hole in the fence. <laughs> oh, it's funny because he's fat, get it? Get it? Oh, and he also falls into an open manhole! Oh wow, what a wild and wacky character, y'all! Aren't you glad this is definitely the person you signed up to watch and not the more interesting and complex cyborg girl over there? Cause I sure am. <laughs> and speak of the devil, at about the halfway mark in the episode, we do get a scene at Limit's place. Here we meet Tomi, who is Limit's nanny slash housekeeper. Like I said, because Limit's mother is gone and her father spends so much time at the lab, there are no other adults to keep the house clean and look after Limit, so hiring a nanny makes sense. Interestingly, Tomi is Japanese, but she lived in Hawaii for many years, which is a neat creative choice. As such, she likes to pepper her speech with random English words and offer advice to Limit based on her time abroad. You know, that's another reason it would be cool to spend more time with Limited Friends, don't you think? Don't ya? Anyway, later that evening, Gu gets tired and falls off the couch, which worries Limit. Tomi reassures her, though, that Gu can't get sick. He just has a low battery right now. After all, he's a machine and not an animal, so there's no need to worry, right? And Limit says, <laughs> Limit wanders to her room. Cue sad cyborg on piano angsting in soft focus about not feeling human anymore. We then get a flashback to the plane crash that nearly killed Limit. This bit is mildly graphic, with blood spatter scene transitions and a shot of human Limit gushing blood out of her neck in the wake of the crash. During her life-saving surgery, we also get an Astro Boy-esque cross-section of Limit's robotic insides while her father operates on her. It's so wild. I love it. I love it so much. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you enjoying that interesting cyborg story just now? Well, why don't we interrupt that and hard cut to an amusement park with Boss and Friends for some more wacky shenanigans? Okay, that's cool. Uh, yep, sure. All right, yeah, that's just what I wanted. 
Let's go. So Lemon and Boss get on a roller coaster together. The coaster gets stuck. Boss freaks out and he tries to climb down. The coaster carts start rolling backwards. Lemon saves Boss by Miracle jumping down with him and no one else sees her do this because onlookers were trying to avoid seeing two kids turn into smears on the tracks. Boss wets his pants after landing, too freaked out to realize what just happened. Hooray? We then finish out the episode the next day, with Boss again bragging to his classmates about his supposed act of bravery. Limit has no time for this malarkey, instead choosing to watch the ocean from her favorite treetop. Girl, you have got the right idea. Ugh, man, I wouldn't harp on all the Boss stuff in episode 1 if it were just in that episode, but it quickly becomes a pattern for the whole show. A lot of the episodes I watched, especially the early ones, focused heavily on shenanigans with Boss, Tomo, and a handful of other side characters, with ironically limited time for Limit herself. Not to mention some of this stuff is just obnoxiously written and presented, with certain episodes hinging on problems of the day that are stupid even by Toei standards. This made getting into the show super difficult at first, I was almost ready to write the whole thing off after episodes 2 and 3, which are both pretty dire. Episode 2 is about Boss suddenly getting very good at math, while Limit struggles with a series of mysterious headaches. Eventually it's revealed that Boss has a newfangled piece of highfalutin technology called... A POCKET CALCULATOR! And for... reasons... This calculator emits electronic signals strong enough to mess with Limit's cyber brain. That's right, folks! Our heroine, super fast, super agile, super strong, and can only be defeated by her one weakness, calculators! A really small calculator, a really silent electronic, a really fast thinker, one that works anywhere on battery or plug-in, one with all the calculator know-how you'll probably ever need. Introducing the world's smallest electronic calculator from the Episode 3 hurt my brain even worse. In this one, Buko's baby sister sees Limit using her miracle jump. You'd think this would be a non-problem because, well, baby. But Limit starts obsessing over this baby, somehow spilling her secret to everyone. Why? Because... Because who knows this baby might randomly learn how to say, Hey everyone, Limit's a cyborg! Or maybe she'll learn hiragana or baby sign language and tell everyone what she saw that way. Or, or people could find out because, because... Because they just might, okay? Man, I know that Limit's paranoid about her secret being found out, but this seemed like a stretch even considering that. All the jokes around it are just dragged out and dragged out and it was infuriating to sit through even for me who is used to draggy Toei plots by now. It was awful! I can't even express. Ugh. Thankfully, the show starts to find a better groove as it goes. Episode 4 introduces a rich girl bully character named Mitsuko. This is an archetype we've seen before in the genre, but it still works to vary up the types of conflict we see in the series. Plus, Mitsuko herself has some pockets of complexity in her personality, leading her to have an on-again, off-again friendship with Limit and Buko over the course of the series. I honestly started looking forward to episodes with Mitsuko in them. She's a fun character. Episode 4 also has Limit grapple with some complex feelings about her body as she realizes she's not likely to age the way she is right now. This causes her distress when she thinks about a boy in class she likes named June, and how she probably won't ever be able to grow up with him or tell him how she feels. This is decently compelling stuff. Shame this subject arises from nowhere and disappears again just as fast, though. Despite the prevalence of Boss throughout the show, there thankfully are a few other good episodes that focus on Limit herself. In episode 6, Limit's father, Dr. Nishiyama, misses parents' day at school despite promising he would be there, and the whole conflict for that episode revolves around Limit's frustrations with him constantly putting his work over her.
The episode ends with them making up and Dr. Nishiyama revealing to Limit that the work he's doing will soon allow her robot body to grow like a human body. Not sure how I feel about the writers trying to justify him breaking promises like that, but the episode still works otherwise. Episode 9 is another good I don't like my body episode, when Limit's friends remark that she never seems to forget things or get sick like they do. Almost like she's a machine. Hmm. Of course, this is exactly the kind of thing that sends Limit spiraling into existential angst. At home, she cries and insists to herself that she is human, damn it! And then the rest of the episode, she pretends to forget things and fakes a fever to stay home from school, trying to convince others, and herself, that she isn't some flawless machine. Episode 19 is a super rare treat. A ski trip episode with no boss in it whatsoever! The title of this episode is Phantom Wolf, and it features a lot of cool animal and wilderness artwork. It just ends up being a filler boy and his wolf episode otherwise, but still. Badass. Speaking of titles, something I noticed was that this series has a lot of unique animations for the episode title cards. Other Toei series have had custom title cards as well, but it felt like they were particularly frequent and noticeable in Limit Chun. Some have the text move, or use special fonts, or artwork that fits the episode. Some even have full-on cartoon title sequences, like this one where a rooster lays an egg. Not much else to say on that front. I just thought it was neat. I just think they're neat. Episode 22 isn't entirely about Limit. Mostly it's about an old dude and some swans. But the first chunk of it shows the depths of Limit's paranoia. It opens with her going for a routine medical test at school, where an x-ray machine reveals her cybernetic heart. All of Limit's teachers and friends point in shock and laugh at her as she runs away, and the scene rapidly distorts and blankets itself in darkness. And of course, this all turns out to be a nightmare. Understandably, Limit is quite shaken. To make matters worse, Mitsuko later quarrels with Limit and accuses her of being like a doll with no heart. Limit gets so caught up in thought after that, that she doesn't see an old woman trapped in traffic on her way home, causing Boss of all people to scold her. When Limit vents her fears and frustrations to her dad, he shows her a picture of her mother and her when they were younger to cheer her up. A nice thought, but it only serves to remind Limit of the life she no longer has, making her even more upset. At this point, Limit finds the old dude in the swan and that plot takes over. It has something to do with the swan being too injured to fly and being unable to be with its mother, I think. Again, I watch these in raw Japanese, give me some slack. However, there's a part near the end where the swan is taken to Dr. Nishiyama's lab for surgery. The surgery scene strongly mirrors that of Limit's own in the beginning of the series. Though the episode doesn't state this outright, the swan recovering from surgery and learning to fly again seems to imply that, despite the changes to Limit's body, Limit is still Limit, still truly and wonderfully human at her core. Most of the other episodes are, as I said, standard Toei fare. Lots of dull filler, some baffling shenanigans, again, loads of Boss and Co bumbling around and taking up screen time. This might not have been so bad on a weekly airing schedule, but it um, sure makes binge watching for <clears throat> a magical girl retrospective difficult. Mm. Still, not all of the non-limit focused episodes are bad. The strongest are probably the ones focused on Buko. She gets two episodes of note. One where she gets angry at Limit over a broken promise and starts hanging out with Mitsuko instead. And another where she gets into ice skating and becomes jealous of Limit's talent at it. These episodes helped make Buko one of the more interesting best friend characters we've seen in the genre so far. We get to see some compelling vulnerabilities on display for her, and the show really puts her relationship with Limit to the test in ways we haven't seen a lot thus far. I dig it. It's good. Sadly, the final episode isn't much to write home about. It concludes the series more than, say, Sarutobi Etchan did, but it's still very underwhelming. It starts with Limit's class finding out that their teacher, Ms. Otohime, is getting married and quitting her job soon. Most of the episode is spent trying to figure out who Otohime's fiancé is, and preparing to give her a goodbye present. 
And of course, a good chunk is spent on fluff with Boss and Tomo mistaking their dentist for the fiance and getting some toothaches for their trouble. <laughs> oh, hilarious. One of the more interesting bits happens near the beginning when we see Limit fantasizing about being grown up and having someone propose to her. This is played for laughs, but hey, it's still nice to see that she's confident enough in herself by this point that she can imagine this sort of thing freely. The other notable development is at the end, when Limit and her father find Ms. Otohime on a cliffside road. A fellow teacher named Mr. Sakata has fallen to the rocks below and is in danger of falling into the ocean. Due to some events from earlier, Limit's father has a rope ladder with him, but it's too short to reach the rocks. Deciding there's no other safe option, Limit takes out her flying bag and uses it to rescue Mr. Sakata, revealing her secret to both teachers. You'd think this kind of bombshell would have a major impact on the story. However, we skip over all the explanations and reactions and get straight to the part where Otohime and Sakata accept Limit as she is and thank her for her help. Weirdly, there's more excitement shown over Sakata being Otohime's fiance than there is over Limit's cyborgness. Advanced cybernetics the likes of which the world has never seen? Huh, go fig. The teacher's bow is who now? Oh my god, stop the presses, now this is news! The final scene is a montage of Limit doing Limit things. In voiceover, Ms. Otohime says that she and her husband will never forget her and that she's a fantastic cyborg girl. She promises to keep Limit's secret and says that maybe someday, It'll be her wishing Limit well when she becomes a bride herself. Limit blushes and turns away as Ms. Otohime says goodbye, and then turns to wave goodbye herself. Huh. That was... nice, I guess? A little rushed, more than a little anticlimactic, but the sentiment is fine at least. The final episode of Miracle Girl Limit-chan aired on March 25th, 1974. Unsurprisingly, given the show's uneven quality and the existence of a more exciting magical android show, the ratings weren't the greatest. Ah, oh, who could have imagined? This must have been a disappointment for Toei considering the marketing push they gave this show. Based on the model of their past successes, Toei put out a lot of merchandise for Limit-chan, including dolls, a toy pendant, records, picture books, coloring books, games, bento boxes, and more. General advertising for the show was big too, up to and including Limit being featured on the cover of TV Guide magazine, which was a big deal considering anime only featured on these covers maybe once a year or so. Cutie Honey didn't get nearly the same level of marketing and merch, and considering how well that show did in the ratings, that must have felt like an extra kick in the pants for Toei. Ugh. That said, Limit Chan wasn't entirely unsuccessful. In fact, in the years following, it ended up being somewhat of a cult hit. According to the surprisingly thorough Wikipedia article, albeit not very well sourced, so take this with a grain of salt, the series apparently reran several times on NET throughout 1978, plus a couple times on another channel, TVK. According to the Japanese wiki page, a new remaster of the series also ran in 2008 on the Toei channel, broadcasting from March to June of that year. And based on Japanese blog postings I could find, there may have been some other undocumented re-airings in the 80s and 90s in various local markets. Whether there was actual demand for Limit Chen, or the channels were just using the show to fill airspace is unclear. However, the result was still that more people were able to see the series and become fans of it. Based on rough translations of Japanese fan sites and BBS comments, it seems that Limit Chen is remembered nostalgically among Majoko fans as a striking show with an appealing main character and challenging themes, if maybe not the best animation or pacing. Limit hasn't appeared in much other media, but there were several manga adaptations of the series running alongside its initial airing. A couple ran in the first and third grade versions of Shogaku magazine and were drawn by Shigeto Ikehara, a student of Osamu Tezuka's best known for his work on the Mega Man manga. Other short serializations in Shogaku publications were drawn by Mariko Okamura and Midori Shimura. Another lady named Izumi Sakyo, formerly Kaori Miki, ran a serialization in Weekly Shoujo Comic, which apparently was the only one to get a proper ending. And yet another ran in the magazine Terebi Land, drawn by Ryu Morio and Shinya Takahashi, 
the latter of whom did animation direction and character designs on Chappie the Witch. I couldn't find much information about any of these runs, aside from some scattered scans, but still, just the sheer number of them is impressive and indicative of Toei's marketing push for the show. Next, let's go over a few more behind-the-scenes notes. First, I should explain something about the format of the series. At the top of every episode, Limit gives a short greeting to the audience where she explains that she's a cyborg. For the first few episodes, Limit also states that she doesn't mind being a cyborg. However, as part of network self-regulation efforts, Toei reevaluated this language as insensitive, thinking it might imply there was something wrong with Limit. If that doesn't make sense to you, think of it like someone saying, Oh, she doesn't mind being in a wheelchair. Such phrasing could imply that being in a wheelchair is inherently negative, something one normally would mind. While undoubtedly there are wheelchair users who do mind using them, there are also many who don't just not mind, but view their chair as a great source of freedom and joy in their lives. Reducing the use of these kinds of assistive devices to some inconvenience or defect that one must tolerate, that one can only not mind as opposed to genuinely love, does a disservice to the experiences of many disabled people. Similar thinking seems to have gone into changing the greetings in Limit-chan. Limit often dealt with insecurities about her body as a character, but it was a step too far to imply in these more authoritative, out-of-character scenes that having a different kind of body was inherently bad. So, starting with episode 8, they changed the greeting to have Limit say that not a huge change, but a surprisingly subtle and forward-thinking one. Next, let's talk staff and casting. First off, scripts were still largely being handled by Majoko veterans Masaki Tsuji and Shinichi Yukimuro. You'd think this would be good for keeping a baseline level of quality, but I really have to wonder if Yukimuro at least was off his game around this time. Some of the worst episodes of the series, including episodes 2 and 3, were written by him. Hmm. The series' score and theme songs were written by another Toei veteran, Shinsuke Kikuchi. It's interesting that of all Toei's Magical Girl shows, this was the only one he ever worked on. I say that because Kikuchi scored a lot of Toei's biggest ever properties, including Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, Dr. Slump, Kamen Rider, and Getter Robo. So of all the Majoko series so far, this one may have the most quintessentially Toei soundtrack. Otherwise, there is unfortunately not much to say about Limit's voice actor, Yoko Kuri. Her most prominent roles were all in very obscure series, with her other leading roles being the title characters in Vicky the Little Viking and The Adventures of Hutch the Honeybee. The cast also includes familiar Majoko alumni like Sachiko Chijimatsu, as both Gu and Dr. Nishiyama's assistant Midori, Masako Nozawa as Tomi and one of Boss's minions, and Akira Kamiya sharing the role of Jun with a couple of other actors throughout the series. There were two other notable actors in the supporting cast, though. The first was Hidekatsu Shibata, who played Dr. Nishiyama. Shibata is a major veteran who's been working in the industry since 1957, and is best known as Baron Ashura in Mazinger Z, King Bradley in Full Metal Alchemist, both the narrator and the character of Igneal in Fairy Tale, and Monkey D. Dragon, the father of Luffy, in One Piece. 
Seems fitting that a guy with such an authoritative voice would play Limit's distant scientist father. Though Shibata does a good job with the more tender scenes as well. The second actor of note is Ryoko Yoshida, who played Mitsuko. She started working in the early 70s, and her career picked up steam very quickly from there, with major supporting roles in big shows like Heidi, Getter Robo, Captain Harlock, and The Rose of Versailles, plus the lead in the 1981 comedy series Miss Machiko. Her most notable roles, though, were the title characters in both Majoko Megu-chan and Majoko Tickle. So, yeah, just a heads up, we'll be talking more about Ryoko Yoshida in future episodes of Maho Profile. Lastly, and most interestingly, Miracle Girl Limit Chan gained some international recognition in, where else? Italy. In the 1981 Italian dub, Limit became Cybernella, pronounced Cibernella in Italian. Confusingly, the full series title was Cyber Nella, Limit Miracle Girl. As far as I can tell, Nella is never called Limit in the dub, so in addition to the weird syntax there, the Limit part just doesn't make any sense for this version. Huh. Also confusingly, while it's pretty clear that Nella is still a cyborg in this version, I mean, it's right there in the title, the dub avoids the word cyborg and tries to make Nella a more explicitly magical character. According to Majoko superfan Retro Sofa, whom I consulted with for this video, there's maybe like one episode where she's called a Makina, and that's it. Thankfully, that and the whole Cybernella thing seem to be the only major changes. Most of the other characters' names remain intact, they never pretend the story isn't set in Japan, and the overall story remains the same. But yes, it seems that nostalgic love is still alive and well for Cybernella in Italy. I was able to find several Italian fan pages dedicated to the show on Facebook and other sites, and there's a decent amount of Cybernella fan art, writing, and cosplay out there too. Plus a few fun covers of the opening on YouTube. Unfortunately, though, no other countries besides Italy picked up the series, which has kept its international reach smaller than other Majoko titles. Alright then, I think that wraps us up on Miracle Girl Limit Chen. While an uneven mess in some respects, this show has some unquestionably strong and unique elements that captured the attention of many fans despite its shortcomings. Limit's story helped change the face of this fledgling genre with new subject matter, new ways of thinking about magic, and a newer, more introspective brand of heroine. It's a shame she didn't get the show she deserved, but I'm glad she exists all the same. We love you, Limit Chan! And... Okay, no fakeouts this time. The next show in our chronology, as I alluded to earlier, started not long after Limit and ran parallel to her in NET's Saturday afternoon block. Yes, it's time. She was the original magical warrior. She was the first magical girl with a show aimed at a male audience. 
and she is the earliest magical girl that many anime fans are familiar with, for better and for worse. Next episode, we're talking about Gona Guy's legendary warrior of love, Cutie Honey. Brace yourselves, because this is gonna be a big one. Kawaru ayo. Thanks so much again to all my patrons who support me every month, especially Author X, Julia and Kyle, Lavitz, Otaku no Podcast, and Outcats Nya! And as always, Rally Vincent deserve better, and the best transformation phrase is still Takumakumayakon, Takumakumayakon! Gokigan yo, motherfuckers! I wouldn't be doing this if not for the generous support of viewers like you. You can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Aaron Cerise. You can make small one-time donations at ko-fi.com slash Aaron Cerise. Or you can always share this video and leave a like or comment to show your support. Thanks so much again and have a good day! Goodbye!